Well, let's turn in our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, and today we're reading verses 17 to 20, page 810 in the Church Bible, 963 if you're needing to use the large print Bible. It is, humanly speaking, purely coincidental that we have come to this passage today in the light of the question in the New City Catechism that David's been speaking about, what some people call a God thing, which is kind of strange, as though there were things that were not God providentially governed in our lives, but we're going to read uh, 5.17 to 20. And then uh, with the psalmist pray that we may be helped to understand it. Jesus says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now let's have a word of prayer. Pray with the psalmist. Lord, open our eyes that both together as a church family and individually as members of it or visitors to it, open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of your law. We pray this in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I dare say these verses, Matthew 5, 17 to 20, are certainly among the most important verses in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And since Matthew 5 through 7 is set within the 28 chapters of Matthew's gospel, I dare say that they are also among the most important verses in Matthew's gospel. I think we could go even further and say they're actually among the most important verses in the whole of the New Testament. Misunderstand these verses, and there'll be many things in the New Testament we are also likely to misunderstand. And I think, therefore, just to build up the anticipation that may decrease during the course of the sermon, they are therefore inevitably among the most important verses in the Bible. And there have been many Christians who would give testimony to that. Uh, One of them, whose name you will know and whose hymns we often sing together, John Newton, who was undoubtedly one of the the wisest pastors the Church of England has ever known, writes to a correspondent that he believes misunderstanding of the law of God lies at the bottom of most religious errors. Misunderstanding of the law of God lies at the bottom of most religious errors. And so if we can grasp what Jesus is saying here, we may well be saved from many errors. And it's fairly clear, I think, in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, that that's exactly what Jesus is seeking to do here. Uh, He's seeking to save that group of people who had come to listen to him, and his disciples in particular, who he was teaching here. There were crowds there, but it was when the disciples came to him 
uh, verse 1 in chapter 5 says that Jesus began to teach them. And if you turn over to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, you, you get a, a, a little uh, interview with those who were there, like uh, the television cameras outside Trinity Church at the end of the service saying, well, what did you think of that? And the answer people was, the, the answer people were, were giving was, well, that was different. It was so different from the teaching we usually hear from the Pharisees and the scribes, the, the people who, who dominate the teaching platforms teach in a different way, and they seem to say very different things. And in a way, that's a clue to what many people have thought is, is like a, a sudden shift in what Jesus is doing here in the Sermon on the Mount. He, he is speaking in these first uh, 19 verses or so about the way of blessing, but in verse 17, there is this, this kind of sudden shift, a sea change, where all of a sudden he starts speaking about the law. And obviously the first question, if, if we're studying this carefully, is why this sudden shift? He's been speaking about the way of blessedness and the, the fruitfulness of that in the Christian's life, that he or she becomes light in the world and the salt of the earth, a city that's set on a hill that cannot be hidden, salt that doesn't lose its savor and brings the taste of the kingdom of heaven to a corrupt and corrupting world, and then suddenly he shifts from blessedness to law. Why does he do that? Well, precisely because he was not teaching the way the scribes and the Pharisees did. That's why his first words here in verse 17 are, do not think that. Why would he say, do not think that? But because he knew that's what people were thinking. He turned over a couple of chapters uh, to the healing of the paralyzed man who was let down through the roof, and you get a little glimpse into Jesus' psychology. The scribes and the Pharisees are sitting there, and Matthew tells us Jesus knew what they were thinking. And in a sense, it, it didn't need supernatural revelation for him to understand that any scribes and Pharisees sitting in this crowd spying on him, which they customarily did, and people who had been taught by them were thinking, he's used the word blessed nine times, and he hasn't mentioned the law of God, the Torah, a single time. And certainly the scribes and Pharisees instinctively would be thinking back to the opening words of the first psalm that set the tone for the whole Psalter. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the man. And that psalm goes on to speak about the man who is righteous and therefore about righteousness. And what is it that characterizes the blessedness of the man who is right and righteous? Well, it's that he meditates, literally mutters, on the law of God day and night. So if you're in the crowd here, and certainly if you're a scribe or a Pharisee, you are thinking, how dare he? How dare he dispense with the law of God as the God-ordained way of righteousness, and that way of righteousness being the way of blessedness. He is turning the whole thing upside down, and he is neglecting what is really important. And what is really important is that we devote ourselves to the study of Torah and to living it out in its minute details as the way to righteousness. That was essentially Orthodox Judaism with which Jesus was familiar, and it still exists. 
Uh, you know that like Roman, Roman Catholics, there are, there, are, there are always divisions in religious groups, uh, like Presbyterians. And the same in Jesus' time was true of Jews, wasn't it? There were scribes and there were Pharisees. And they didn't go on with each other. They belonged to different denominations. And the same is true in Judaism today. And we're fairly familiar because of what we see on television of, of, of Jewish people who look exactly like ourselves. They dress as though they were Westerners. In all practical ways, they are Westerners. Uh, it just so happens Benjamin Netanyahu was educated about three miles away from where David's brother teaches at Westminster Seminary. Sounds thoroughly Western. But then you'll see people who are dressed very differently. Different hairstyles, different hats, different gear. I had a very vivid illustration of this years ago. I happened to be flying uh, economy class, let me emphasize, uh, on a flight from Newark Airport in New Jersey to Tel Aviv Airport in Israel. And of course, the plane began to fill up with, with Orthodox Hasidic Jews, roots in, in many of them Eastern Europe, uh, very distinctively dressed. And I was sitting, as usual, in the aisle seat. There was a, 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 a Jewish lady sitting in the window seat, and there was a seat in the middle. And uh, one of the, the Orthodox Jews came on, and as he came near to where we were sitting, I, I noticed him looking at his boarding pass very nervously and glancing at the seat between us and looking at his boarding pass very nervously, and, and I could see he, he was going to speak to one of the cabin staff. Why? Because I was obviously not kosher, and this woman was even less kosher. And the idea of spending 10 hours or whatever stuck between a Gentile and a secular Jewish lady was anathema to him. Um, the bonus was there was a spare seat all night long. But I kept my eye on him. And what really struck me was the zeal of this man for the first psalm misunderstood. The whole night long I could see him muttering as his finger was moving on Torah. I, 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 this, you may think this was a slightly cynical thought, but I thought to myself, dear friend, if you'd only known Jesus, we could have had a great time with you sitting here in the middle seat. It was like seeing what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, that whenever they read Torah, there is a veil over their eyes. And this is, this is, this is what lies behind Jesus' teaching here. The sense of anger that he knows is rising up in the hearts of some, perhaps many of those who are listening to him, and they are thinking he's come to abolish the law. And that's why his first words were really, I know what you're thinking, so do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And in the three verses that follow, he emphasizes this point in three different ways. First of all, in verse 18, with a kind of oath, with an amen statement. Truly is a translation of the word amen. So this is a kind of oath that Jesus is taking. Truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, not a, one of those little squiggles in the Hebrew alphabet will pass away from the law of God until it is accomplished. Verse 19. If verse 18 he is his emphasis with an oath that the law will be fulfilled, verse 19 is his emphasis with a warning. Anyone who 
diminishes the law of God, one of the least of these commandments, something the rabbis used to love discussing, which is the least of these commandments. And a lot of them thought it was the commandment about uh, you can't steal the mother and also the eggs. You can steal the eggs as long as you leave the mother. Not the least of these commandments is going to pass away, says Jesus, until all is accomplished. And anyone who teaches that diminishes themselves, if not actually excludes themselves from the kingdom of heaven. And then he emphasizes it with an implication. I tell you, and this is to his disciples, to the crowd, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. The scribes and Pharisees view the law, yes, given by God in his grace, but they view the law as a way of sustaining and establishing the righteousness which, as it is accomplished, will give them favor in the sight of Yahweh. And Jesus is saying, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And he couldn't put it more forcefully that he has not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. Which leads to the million pound question, or maybe it's gone up in value, maybe it's a five million pound question now. How is it that Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets? What does he mean when he says that he has come to fulfill them? Now, with respect to the prophets, the answer to that question is, is actually relatively simple because Matthew has already given us a series of Old Testament prophecies that he specifically said the Lord Jesus fulfilled. And what he means by that, he means by that what, what, what 1 Peter 1, 10 to 12 means, that the, the prophets in the Old Testament looked forward to the the fulfillment of their prophecies, but, but what they felt they had was just like the outline shape. And what Jesus is saying is, what, what I've come to do is to, to, join in, to join all the dots in the prophecies so that when those dots are joined, you see that those prophecies have actually been an outline shape of myself, the Messiah, the Savior, so the answer to the question, how does he fulfill the, the word of the prophets, is, is relatively straightforward. But I think as Christians for us, the big question that we find ourselves asking is, well, how is that true of the law? And I think it's helpful here for us to think that fulfill is really another way of saying fill full. Fulfill is another way of saying, fill full. And when you fulfill or fill full something, that filling full, that fulfillment, takes on the shape of what it's filling. And I think that's a helpful way to think about the law of God. Because one of the things that becomes clearer in the New Testament, granted, but is actually, is actually embedded also in the Old Testament, is that the single law of God actually came to the people in, in three different dimensions. Um, forget this illustration if it doesn't help you, but... Um, in a sense, the law of God is like an egg. It has a, it has a shell that, that holds in the inside. It has the white and it has the yolk. It's one egg, but it, it's kind of three-dimensional. And actually, if you just look at the egg, you, you know, unless you know in advance, and you're an egg scientist or an egg-centric, you have no idea what's inside, but crack it open, 
and you realize that this egg is kind of three-dimensional. And exactly the same becomes crystal clear in the New Testament, but it's actually really clear in the Old Testament as well. That when God gave the law through Moses, he, he gave it in this three-dimensional form. Um, and traditionally, in our, in our church, it's in our confession, Westminster Confession, chapter 19, which is a great chapter. Traditionally, that's been understood by Christians as this triple form, that God gave the Ten Commandments, like the yolk of the egg, God gave the Ten Commandments as the foundation of his law. He surrounded those Ten Commandments with, with what we call ceremonial law. So if any of you follow the McShane Bible calendar, um, which can be tough going, four chapters a day, you'll know that if you do that regularly, when you come to April, you begin to groan because April's the month for Leviticus. And you, 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 you scarcely, you get the occasional exception, you scarcely get out of priests and blood and wave offerings. And you're thinking, what is this? You know, <laughs> help me, <laughs> help me get into numbers. Um, that's the ceremonial law. And then there was this other, what you might call the eggshell of the whole thing that in a sense was, was the boundary for these people, was the civil law that, that regulated their ordinary lives, that, that, that regulated them as a nation. And, and what's so interesting about the giving of the law and also the New Testament's teaching on the law is that these, these three different parts of the egg were intended to function in different ways. So the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, was intended to function as the permanent foundation for everything. Actually, the reason for that was because the Ten Commandments was God giving his people, writing for his people, the pattern and lifestyle that he had embedded in Adam and Eve by nature, the way human beings are meant to function in relationship to and fellowship with God. And those Ten Commandments had a unique role. And that unique role is evidenced um, if you're using the ordinary church Bible on page 148 in Deuteronomy chapter 4, and re-emphasized in the letter to the Hebrews, the only part of the divine law given to Moses that was placed in the Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments. The only part of the law that was written by the finger of God was the Ten Commandments. And so we get these hints already in the giving of the law to Moses that there is, there is an aspect of this law that is fundamental to the whole, and in a sense it's different from the whole, because only it is embedded in the fundamental covenant relationship that God has with human beings. And so God spoke the Ten Commandments. He wrote the Ten Commandments. And Moses placed the Ten Commandments, Deuteronomy chapter 10, in the ark. And what the people were being given there was a written form, a rewritten form of what God had written into the human heart, into Adam and Eve by nature. It's a description of how the image of God is meant to function. It's the, it's the, it's the rails along which the locomotion of a life in fellowship with God runs. That's how the image of God is meant to function. And that's why when, as societies, we cease to honor those laws we become dysfunctional and end up creating a million other laws. 
So the law of God was foundational and intended to be permanent with respect to the Decalogue, but that was not so with respect to the ceremonial laws. The ceremonial laws, the sacrificial aspects of the law, were given as a pattern, and therefore they were always intended to be impermanent and temporal. How do we know that? We know that because we're New, Christian, New Testament Christians, we, we tend to discover that by reading the New Testament. And so we're told by the author of Hebrews, aren't we? Beginning of Hebrews chapter 10, that the ceremonial laws were just a shadow of the good things that were to come. They were an outline All this blood. I mean, they say that at Passover time in Jerusalem, you could hardly move for the stench of blood of all these Passover lambs. What was, what was God doing here? I think a good way to think about it is he was giving his people a pop-up picture book version of the way of salvation. So you couldn't move. That's the impression you get, isn't it, from all these sacrifices, daily sacrifices, sin sacrifices. Sacrifices for unintentional sin. All the different animals that you can bring. What's this all about? Why, 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 you kind of, why are you held into this? You can't move without bumping into these pop-up picture book versions of the sacrifice that is still to come. So Hebrews tells us, doesn't it, that the priest had to stand daily, day after day, doing this. And that was an indication that these sacrifices, whatever they were doing, were not fully and finally accomplishing people's salvation. And not only that, the author of Hebrews says, if you just think about it, the sacrifice of the blood of bulls and goats isn't really an adequate sacrifice for the sins of a human being. You can't sacrifice your dog and think that's an adequate substitute for your sin or your cow or your lamb or your bird. But you see, Hebrews says that because Hebrews understands an Old Testament believer would see that. He would see that the priest kept on repeating the sacrifices and Therefore, the sacrifices needed repetition. He would see that the priest never got the chance to sit down because he never accomplished his work. And it's all in the New Testament, a picture of the fact that this was not the sacrificial system that would bring ultimately the forgiveness of sins. But when Jesus, remember, when Jesus made his sacrifice, he what did he do? He sat down at the right hand of God, having once offered for all time a sacrifice appropriate to our sins. And so when Jesus cries out on the cross, it is finished, well, I'm sure there are doctoral dissertations on what did he mean but one thing I'm sure he must have meant was, all of that is finished. And the evidence of it, you remember, later on in Matthew's Gospel is that the veil of the temple, the veil, in a sense, that required the sacrificial blood of animals offered for the priest to go through into the holiest place of all. The veil of the temple was torn in two, and Matthew is very emphatic about this, not from the bottom. It wasn't the sacrifices that were offered at ground level that tore the veil in two, but the sacrifice that was being offered outside the city on Golgotha the divine sacrifice, when God made his own beloved son to be sin for us, although he knew no sin, then the temple veil was ripped from the top to the bottom. And at last, you see, 
the ceremonial law had been fulfilled. In outline shape, it had pointed to the Lord Jesus. And now that the Lord Jesus had come, you don't, you don't need the outline. Like those of you who are, who are intelligent students, you know that you should always write an outline before you write your essay. But when you're ready to press send and your, your faculty member is going to get the essay, then you can tear up the outline. The outline has been fulfilled. And you see, the same is true, although in a different way, of the civil laws that governed God's people. The, the Ten Commandments were embedded in the foundation of our relationship. This is, how you, this is how you respond to God when God has redeemed you. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. I am your Redeemer. I'm restoring you. I'm taking you as my son, and I want you now in your life to be restored to a life of filial devotion to me. But then you need a sacrifice to be made if that's really going to be true. And I'm going to give you pictures of what one day will be true. And I want you to see in those pictures a picture of the one who is going to come. And when he comes, then that aspect of the law will be fulfilled. It will be fulfilled. And therefore not repeated. But then you see, it's really interesting. When Moses talks about this, when Moses speaks to the people, he says, so God wrote the, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. He wrote it himself. But he says, now, here are, the, here are the regulations that he wants me to give to you for your life. And he uses this expression a couple of times, for your life in the land. And from one point of view, that's obvious, isn't it? That's where they're going. They're going to the promised land. But when you when you read Jesus' words, you see that, oh, there's significance in that little expression, in the land. It's a little indication that those civil laws, the regulations and especially the punishments that went with them, those were given to the people when they were a, a, a uni-ethnic group geographically located in a single land. These laws, God says to Moses, I want you to teach the people for when they are in the land. And you, you do get these little indications, don't you, in the Old Testament, that there were individuals who saw that that promise of the blessing God would give when they were in the land was was really just a first stage in God's gracious salvation. Because even from the time of, of Abraham, um, the non-Jew Abraham, he was uncircumcised when God said to him, the blessing that I'm going to give is going to extend to all the families of the earth. And so the way in which that part of the commandments is fulfilled, it, you can demarcate it essentially to the day of Pentecost, to the day when the church of God is no longer a single ethnic community that has some taste of the Spirit of God. But when the prophecy of Joel comes true that God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, not just Jewish flesh. Now, even the apostles found this really difficult to take in, that something cataclysmic was taking place. It wasn't just Jews. It spread throughout the world to whom God was giving his spirit. Remember how Peter discovers, hey, in, in the household of a Gentile centurion, God is doing the same thing. Because now the church of God is no longer a single ethnic community, 
preserved in one particular land. And you can see the divine economy in doing that. But now the church of Jesus Christ, as is represented here among us, men and women, boys and girls, if not quite from every tribe and tongue and nation, representatively from all the ends of the earth. And therefore that function, whatever principles governments may learn from that aspect of God's law, that is no longer its function. That function was fulfilled by preserving this particular nation of whom came the Messiah. And when the Messiah came, um, that, was like, uh, that was like an old, uh, an old jacket that no longer fitted the new world of fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And so you see how Jesus is teaching us the, the, the absoluteness of the law of God, but also the way in which the different dimensions of that law of God come to their fulfillment. Because our Lord Jesus Christ has fulfilled the Decalogue. He was the Decalogue giver and he was the Decalogue keeper. And for our sakes, he fulfilled the law in a, in a life of perfect obedience to his heavenly Father. He was able to say, as no one else has ever been able to say, whatever my Father tells me to do, I do it. And then he fulfilled the law, didn't he? Because he bore for our sakes the judgment of God for our disobedience to that law. And then as becomes, it's hinted here, uh, but it becomes clearer in the rest of the New Testament that he actually fulfills the law somewhere else in the whole course of his life, in the sufferings of his death, and in the gift of his Holy Spirit to his disciples. That's actually the teaching ultimately of the the Old Testament itself, isn't it? When the Spirit comes, when the New Covenant comes, what is the distinguishing feature of those who receive the promises of the New Covenant in Jesus Christ? Well, both Jeremiah and Ezekiel tell us they become careful to keep the law of God. That can't conceivably mean the ceremonial law it clearly doesn't mean the civil law. It means the foundational law. Because what the Spirit does when he comes to renew our lives is to renew us in the image of our Creator so that we're given new instincts. And you see, instead of turning the Old Testament upside down, Jesus was turning the Old Testament, the right way up. Because obedience to the law of God is not the pathway to a hoped-for accomplishment of righteousness that will make us potentially acceptable to God sometime in the future. But it's actually the blessedness of the ministry of the Spirit producing in us progressively an increasing likeness to the Lord Jesus Christ, who in his life himself fulfilled the law of God. And it is interesting to me, you know, having lived, I've survived as long as I have. You know, when I was a young Christian, if you said to somebody, for example, do you think you're acceptable to God? Um, a huge percentage of a rather religious population in Scotland then would say, I hope I've done enough. I hope I've done enough. Or, if there's a little uber confidence, I think I've done enough. Or I'm pretty sure I've done enough. But you see, they, were, they had turned the Bible upside down, hadn't they? 
They, they turned the gospel upside down. They turned grace upside down. Although they might even say, well, I learn in the church that God is gracious, so I hope I've done enough. And Jesus is saying the same. because This is our native disposition, friends, isn't it? Hope that we've done enough. Sometimes even when people are spiritually awakened and you talk to them, they'll say, I, I'm going to try harder. And Jesus is, is turning the gospel the right way up. And he's saying, the law is only really going to be fulfilled. And the verses that follow tell us how deep that goes when your righteousness is not a righteousness that you hope for like a scribe or Pharisee that will be acknowledged by God at the end of your life, but when that blessedness is a gift from God at the beginning of your life. And for some of us, that's, that, it, it, that can be a very real experience. If you've been someone who thought that was the way to acceptance with God, the truth of the gospel, like, turned you on your feet at last. You'll forgive a personal illustration. I was brought up in a non-church going home that kept the Sabbath day with exceptional rigor. Exceptional rigor. Uh, we did nothing on the Sabbath day, including go to church. We did absolutely nothing on the Sabbath day. And, and frankly, until when I was a, a young teenager, I became a believer Sunday was the worst day of the week. It was like being asked to, to make bricks without straw. It was a terrible day. And then the words of Jesus came to me. You search the scriptures, and I'd been doing that. You search the scriptures because you think in reading Torah and trying to obey Torah, you have eternal life. And your problem is, there's the very first verse in the Bible that ever seemed to walk out and hit me in the face as a 14-year-old. Your problem, Sinclair, is that you haven't come to me for life. And when that happened, hey, we're talking 60 years now. 60 years, 52 weeks in the year, that's 3,000 and something, isn't it? Of enjoying the worst day turned into the best day. Because what Jesus has in view here is that the law will be fulfilled, not as the enemy that destroys me, but as the friend that guides me. And you see, at the end of the day, there is no point in me saying, oh yeah, I've heard the Sermon on the Mount, I'm going to try harder. No, what we need to do is to come to him who has fulfilled the law. And then by his spirit, he will begin to fulfill it in us. So Jesus is turning the Old Testament the right way up. And when we hear him and respond to him, uh, the great thing is he begins to turn us the right way up too. Well, let's pray that he will. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for its challenges to us. We thank you that much of it is so mind-stretching to us, and, and yet you give it to us in a way that, that the simplest of us can begin to understand it, and the wisest of us still feels we can never get to the bottom of this. It's so rich and wonderful because you are so rich and so wonderful. And we pray, Lord, that as your Spirit fulfills the law in our lives and in the process makes us more like you, Lord Jesus, that we may truly be as a fellowship here and where we live and where we work, light in a dark world, uh, 
and salt that will both preserve and give to people a taste of the kingdom of heaven. And we pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen.